Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to join with you in this wonderful um, uh, site just to share my experience in the field of cardiac imaging and this uh, topic specifically in the field of cardiac CT. Uh, the topic that I will discuss in my presentation is uh, the future of cardiac CT from the challenging anatomy to functional evaluation. So there will be a first part in which uh, I will explain you how we can improve our capability to scan the patient thanks uh, uh, the challenging patient, thanks to the new technology, and how then we can implement our accuracy, our positive predictive value, thanks to the addition of functional evaluation uh, with the CT. Uh, so let me just to show you a brief summary about the technology that we are talking about is a compromise between improved spatial and temporal resolution that we can reach thanks to the presence of very wide detector coverage 16 centimeter is enough to do everything in cardiac imaging the Gantry rotation time is very high this is important because we need an excellent temporal resolution to have a good imaging of the coronary arteries we have uh, the possibility to have an acquisition in high definition mode that, that means that we can have a better spatial resolution that is very important in the specific setting of iris patient and then we have the possibility to decrease the noise thanks to the use of dedicated iterative reconstruction. This is only my slide about technical summary because I know that the technical aspects sometimes are a little bit boring and so for this reason we move to the clinical application. First, why we need a better spatial resolution? We need a better spatial resolution because when we have a calcification, the accuracy of cardiac CT is limited and this is one of the main reasons because cardiac CT is actually not indicated in high-risk patient. I will try to demonstrate with you that thanks to the improved the spatial resolution, we can apply this technique also in high-risk patient. Uh, this is the uh, very famous study on radiology uh, 2011 in which the author de demonstrated a very clear point that with the increase of the um, uh, amount of calcification on the coronary artery you can observe a degrees of diagnostic accuracy. This is the diagnostic accuracy when you have non-calcification calcifi and this is the uh, diagnostic accuracy when you have a severe calcification. So you lose several points in terms of diagnostic accuracy because you have not enough spatial resolution. So for this reason, we need to improve the spatial resolution that is uh, crucial in cardiac imaging. And we can improve thanks to the combination of two strategies. First, increase the number of views for each rotation, combined with a better performance of the detector that is actually possible in our and in your hospital, thanks to the uh, availability of the gemstone detector. At the end, the final result is that the spatial resolution is 0.23 mm, very robust spatial resolution. But uh, we have to demonstrate that uh, this better spatial resolution is useful from clinical point of view. And the best setting in which we can test this better spatial resolution is the subset of a patient with high risk for coronary artery disease. Because this patient has a lot of calcification and we can try to understand if we have an improved accuracy also in this setting. And we have tested this point in a paper published on radiology in which we have compared the diagnostic accuracy of a standard CT versus the diagnostic accuracy of a high definition CT acquisition in the subset of a patient at high risk for coronary artery disease. What we found? The first evidence was that there was a, a decrease of the blooming artifact. Indeed, in the standard resolution, you have 18% of a blooming artifact, blooming artifact uh, when you use a standard definition CT, and you observe a decrease of 50% if you use a high definition mode. And the direct result is that you have more cases available for diagnosis. But we are interested to the diagnostic accuracy as well. And when you compare the standard definitions versus high definition CT, you can observe that thanks to this new acquisition, you are able to improve the specificity, 91% up to 96, positive predictive value from 70% to 81%, and diagnostic accuracy from 92% to 97%. And this is also confirmed in a patient-based analysis. 
Just a couple of examples. This is a very famous paper images provided by uh, uh, CCN from Paris because they were very lucky to scan the same patient with the standard definition mode and with the high definition mode. And as you can see, in the high definition mode, there is no blooming effect around the calcification, and this means that you are more accurate to detect the coronary artery lumen. This is another case of a patient in which you have very clear definition of the border of the calcification and therefore there is no risk to declassify this lesion as significant. This is just an intermediate lesion with a good matching with the intermediate lesion that you can find at invasive coronary angiography. So the first key message that you have to keep in your mind that thanks to the improved spatial resolution we can potentially imagine to apply the cardiac CT in every patient. But temp spatial resolution is not enough. We need to improve the temporal resolution, especially if you want to do stress CT. Because if we do stress CT, we have to scan patients with a very high R rate, and we need a better temporal resolution if we want to scan patients with, <coughs> with high R rate. How we can improve the temporal resolution in this scanner? We can improve with the application of three different strategies. First, Intracyclo motion correction algorithm is a post-processing software that delay the misalignment artifact. Second, we can reach this improved tempo resolution with increased uh, gantry rotation time or indirectly with a wide coverage uh, of the CT scan. Because if you are able to scan the patient in one bit, it means that you are less sensitive to misalignment artifact. And let me show our experience on that with the intracycle motion correction algorithm. We have included the patient in this experience that was published on European radiology. We have included the patient with at least one segment not available for misalignment artifact. This was characterized by a cohort of 160 patients. Okay? This means that 18% of the general population can show motion artifact due to high heart rate. When you apply the software, the post-processing software, the intracycle motion correction, you can observe and improve the image quality for all vessels. The intracycle motion correction is the red bar, the standard acquisition is the blue bar, and we observe an improvement of image quality and uh, overall availability for all vessels, left main, LED, left circumflex artery, and right coronary artery. This means that you can decrease the number of patients that are not feasible due to the presence of a motion artifact from 18% up to 7%. This means that more than 100 patients in which you cannot do a diagnosis due to the presence of this artifact, you can overcome this limitation thanks to this software because the patient became feasible and available. This has direct effect in terms of diagnostic accuracy. If you focus your attention on patient-based analysis, you can see that thanks to the motion correction algorithm, you are able to improve the specificity, to improve the positive predictive value, to improve the diagnostic accuracy. <clears throat> Just three examples, practical example to better clarify the concept. Here, this is a patient in which there is no disease on LID, and you find here a very challenging segment because there is an intramyocardial course and there are some motion artifacts. It's very challenging to say if there is stenosis here or not. If we, we, we reproduce these images by using this intracycle motion correction, okay, you have an improved uh, uh, visualization of the lumen and there is no stenosis. But more impressive is the case two, in which this segment is completely not available. If you use the intracycle motion correction algorithm, you have a complete visualization of the vessel with just some spot calcification and no significant coronary artery stenosis. What about case three? Okay, there is no disease here, but this segment is challenging to be evaluated because there is a motion artifact again. With the same software, you delay it completely. The misalignment artifact and the visualization of right coronary is perfect. But you can add to this strategy a further two strategy, the use of a faster gantry rotation time and the use of a wide coverage. And this is our experience, not still published, it is under submission, uh, in which we have tested the use of this new technology in a very, very challenging patient. I mean the patient with atrial fibrillation. Usually atrial fibrillation is a counterindication to be evaluated by CT scan. But thanks to the new technology, we can do something more. What we did? We included the 83 patients with atrial fibrillation and we used as a control group 83 patients with a regular sinus rhythm. 
Please focus your attention about the mean heart rate of the first group, 83 bit per minute versus 63 bit per minute, but more impressive the heart rate variability. In other fibrillation patients, you can have a mean heart rate variability of 30 bits. And on the contrary, when you have a regular sinus rhythm, the heart rate variability is minimal. Um, what we found in terms of diagnostic accuracy, no difference. So it seems that the last generation scanner is insensitive to the uh, heart rate disorder. And so for this reason, actually, we don't consider in our hospital atrial fibrillation a contraindication for cardiac CT scan. We scan this patient, patient without previous uh, stent. Native coronary arteries, is, uh, if they are uh, in atrial fibrillation, this is not still a contraindication. Some examples. Check the EKG of this patient. Very high heart rate due to the presence of atrial fibrillation. 100 bit, 94 bit. The acquisition has been done here, so in a bit in which the heart rate was 94, and this is the image quality of the coronary arteries, no disease. The um, uh, CT is perfectly uh, diagnostic, no disease in this patient. This is another patient with again other fibrillation, check the images, 82 bit per minute here, 71 bit per minute here, so very huge variability, more than 10 bits, and this is the images. You find intermediate lesion of the LED here, well matched with intermediate lesion that you find on invasive cornea and geography. This is another intermediate lesion of left circumflex artery with a good matching with the intermediate lesion that you find on left circumflex artery during the invasive cornea and geography. But all this improved spatial and tempo resolution is mainly useful to do something more that is, to evaluate the functional significance of coronary artery disease. Historically, CT has been considered an anatomical test, and uh, we can just describe what happened in terms of anatomical perspective. And this is a very big limitation, because the cardiology, historically, is more focused on the functional aspect of coronary artery disease, and absolutely less interested what happened in terms of coronary artery stenosis. So for this reason, to try to do this job with the CT is quite mandatory. And uh, we have actually two different ways to evaluate the functional relevance of coronary artery disease. The two ways are fractional flow reserve and stress CT perfusion. What about the fractional flow reserve? Just a brief introduction for the people with the radiological background to just understand what is the invasive FFR. The acronym FFR means fractional flow reserve, and the invasive FFR is the fall in terms of pressure and the fall of flow uh, uh, in condition of a maximum vasodilatation. Let me uh, just show you this picture. Uh, if you have uh, here a stenosis and you measure a pressure of 100 here, and then you, pressure, uh, you measure a pressure of 70 uh, after the stenosis, the FFR is the uh, ratio between this value and this value. And there is, in condition of maximum vasodilatation, a direct relationship between this pressure gradient and the flow. So this means that you have a stenosis and you are able to measure the clinical, the physiological impact of this stenosis on the coronary artery circulation. And this concept is very important because this number takes in account of the, of the, takes in account the balance that there is between the degree of stenosis that is responsible for the flow and how many left ventricle myocardial mass you have to uh, supply. Just a practical example. Imagine that this is your, oops, sorry. Imagine that this is your uh, uh, coronary arteries, okay? And this is your flow. Then it's completely different if you need to provide blood to this kind of ground, this flow could be enough, or if you have to provide water for this kind of ground, and the same flow could be not enough. If you just evaluate the coronary artery disease in the perspective of what happened in terms of coronary artery anatomy, percentage of stenosis, you are not able to understand if that flow is well balanced with the left ventricle myocardial mass that needs to be perfused. The FFRCT, on the contrary, takes in account information, the FFR, invasive FFR takes in account the balance between these two aspects. And it's very important just to show you two further examples. 
These are two different patients. Imagine that these are two different patients. The first patient has a stenosis with a cross section of four millimeters square, and he has to provide blood to a normal myocardium. Below you have the same a pa another patient with the same stenosis, four millimeters square of cross section, but half of the myocardium is involved by scar. So he needs to provide blood in a, uh, to a lowest amount of myocardial mass. You have the same stenosis, so the degree of stenosis is the same, but if you calculate the FFI in these two patients, the result is completely different, because in the first case, you have a pathologic FFI, because that flow is not enough for that left ventric myocardial mass. The patient below has enough flow to provide blood to the normal myocardium. And you have exactly the same situation from an opposite perspective. This is a patient with a 50% of a stenosis and a normal invasive FFR. And this is the myocardium that he needs to be perfused. But if the same stenosis has to provide blood to this territory, but he has to provide blood to another territory due to the presence of concomitant occlusion of another vessel, the same stenosis is could be associated with a pathologic FFR because this flow is not enough to provide blood for this territory and for collateral territory as well. So invasive FFR is really something very useful in clinical practice. In two main papers, the FAME 1 and the FAME 2 study has proved that invasive FFR is the most powerful tool to take any kind of decision in terms of revascularization during the CAT lab in intermediate lesion. Now, what do we want to try to do? We want to try to mimic what uh, the interventional cardiologists do, do uh, uh, with invasive FFR. And we are trying to do this with the FFRCT. What is the FFRCT? Okay, you scan your patient with your usual uh, CT scan, you have uh, your DICOM dataset, and then you transfer this information to a dedicated computer that create a 3D model and apply computational fluid dynamics analysis. In this way, is able to provide a 3D visualization of the coronary artery with a colored, colored map, colored scale, in which for each point you are able to provide this number, that is the FFRCT. For example, in this uh, um, uh, patient, you have a stenosis here, and when the color map became a red, it means that from this point up to the end of the vessel, there is a pathologic FFR, pathologic FFRCT. The cutoff that is usually used is below 0.8. If you have FFRCT below 0.8, you have a, 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 probably you have ischemia associated to that lesion. But, uh, okay. That is a very nice movie and a very nice picture, but it's not enough in medicine. We have to prove that it's accurate and that it is cost effective. What about the accuracy? There are several papers on that. I want just to show you the last one, that is the NXT trial. The first author was Beer Nogart from Hall's University, in which they have performed an head-to-head -head comparison of the diagnostic accuracy of FFRCT versus invasive FFR. And what they found? Check, focus your attention on this diagram, the per patient diagnostic accuracy analysis. The, uh, the gold standard technique used in this trial was the invasive FFR, not invasive cone angiography, invasive FFR. They found that if we compare CT versus invasive FFR, the diagnostic accuracy is 53%, very bad. If we implement the cardiac CT with FFR CT, the diagnostic accuracy improve up to 81% better performance. But the most interesting number of this picture is the number in the middle, 64%. 64% is the diagnostic accuracy of the invasive coronary angiography compared to the invasive FFR. And this is very important if you take in consideration that in the real critical world, the largest part of the indication of revascularization are mainly based on the visual estimation of the stenosis of the invasive coangiography. So actually we decided to treat the patient in a large part of the world based on diagnostic tests that has an accuracy of 64%. The great advantage of the FFRCT is that it is less sensitive to the calcification. Uh, 
the people in the room that are usually involved in cardiac CT experience, they have a very common experience in which they found calcification. It's very difficult to estimate the degree of stenosis, less than 50%, more than 50%. And this is a typical setting in which you have a poor accuracy, poor positive predictive value, high risk to refer the patient to CAT, the interventional cardiology do the CAT and then call you, but there is nothing here. Typical discussion in all parts of the world. FFRCT is not sensitive to calcification. Indeed, in this sub-analysis of the NXT trial, they found that the correlation between the FFRCT and invasive FFR in patients with a low calcium score or in patients with a high calcium score is exactly the same. For the analysis, it's enough to have a minimum visualization of the contrast agent inside the lumen. This means that if you have a complete coverage of the vessel with the calcification, it's a problem. But if you have a minimum visualization of the coronary artery lumen to see the contrast agent, you can calculate the FFRCT. And this is very helpful because you can have a typical patient in which you are not able to provide a degree of stenosis from anatomical point of view due to the presence of calcification but you are able to provide the FFRCT number that is, is useful to take the decision if the patient need, needs to be referred to CAT or not. But to demonstrate uh, accuracy is not enough in cardiology. We need to demonstrate the cost effectiveness of a new test. For example, PET is very accurate in cardiology, but there is not still a robust demonstration that is cost effective because it's very expensive. And this is the same for FFRCT. And so for this reason, we have organized this trial that is the platform trial that was an international multicenter trial that involved the 11 uh, institutes in Europe in which we have done the very simple things. We have included the patient symptomatic for uh, suspected coronary artery disease at intermediate risk for coronary artery disease. The standard of care suggests to refer this patient to non-invasive test any kind, exercise, ECG, SPECT, stress MR, stress ECHO, with the test that you prefer. The experimental group was characterized by the introduction of CT plus FFRCT as a first line test or as a second line test in patients with indication for invasive coronary geography. What I mean? I have a patient with suspect with chest pain, positive exercise ECG, for example. This patient is going to CAT. I stop the patient and I tell the patient, no, please do before CT plus FFRCT and we can confirm or not the invasive coronary angiography based on our test. And we have compared these two different strategies in terms of number of invasive coronary angiography avoided, cost and maze, cardiac events. What we have found in this our experience? You can find the main result from the European Art Journal that we published uh, uh, about one year ago uh, with the Pamela Douglas and we found the following result. Follow, uh, focus your attention on this bar graph, okay, and on this number. This is the number, the percentage of uh, invasive coronary angiography that we have cancelled to the evidence that CT plus FFRCT was negative for ischemic heart disease. 61% of the invasive coronary angiography as compared to the standard of care. And when we transfer this information in terms of cost, and this is the cost analysis that you can find on Jack, published uh, one year ago. Again, we found that when we use a CT plus FFRCT strategy as compared to the standard of care, we reduce over 30% the overall cost of management of this patient, mainly because we have reduced the number of invasive coronary angiography. But what happened in terms of a maze? I can cancel an invasive coronary angiography and the patient can die two days after the formal myocardial infection. So I have saved money, but I have lost one life. So it's very important to check the maze. Up to now, we have a follow-up of uh, 15 months and no difference in terms of maze were observed between standard of care and um, uh, FFR, CT plus FFRCT strategy. Our, we take in account to continue to follow up for at least three years. But FFRCT, is not just a number to decide if a stenosis is, is hemodynamically significant or not. It is emerging with a very new tool to do one of the most amazing things to do in cardiology, that is the prediction of the culprit lesion. I mean, I found a lesion and despite it is not significant in terms of coronary artery stenosis, 
I am able to predict that that lesion could be responsible for an event after two, three years. That is the great challenge for the future research in cardiology. And this uh, is the first experience in which uh, this aspect has been evaluated. Uh, this study is not, is not still published, is the Emerald study, in which uh, uh, the design of the study is ve very, very brilliant. So in this study, uh, it is, uh, uh, we have included all patients in which there was that experienced the maze cardiac death or uh, uh, myocardial infarction and so on, that have performed in the two years before a cardiac CT scan for any reason. Then uh, uh, all CT scans have been uh, um, uh, reanalyzed and for each lesion the following parameters were tested. The FFRCT as usual, the delta FFRCT, then the pressure was calculated the Walsh stress was calculated and the axial plaque stress was calculated. And when we analyzed how all these hemodynamic parameters were distributed among non culprit lesion and culprit lesion, check that the culprit lesion, I mean the lesion that were responsible for the event two years later, had all different hemodynamic parameters as compared with the non culprit lesion. Just some examples. This is a patient of 65 years old. Uh, we found uh, symptomatic for chest pain. We found this typical lesion, mixed plaque, and the stenosis was estimated as 60%. We have uh, two questions in our mind when we have this kind of lesion. First, is it true obstructive coronary artery disease or not? There is calcium and uh, there is the risk of potential overestimation of the lesion. Second question, okay, if it is true obstructive coronary artery disease, it is ischemic or not, because 60% can be associated enough of the cases with ischemia and enough of the cases without ischemia. To give an answer to this question, usually the standard of care suggests to refer the patient to a second level stress test. Better if you have a perfusion test. SPECT, in my lab we do a lot of stress MR. But if you have FFRCT, you can analyze the same data set, have this number that is normal, and the conclusion is a no flow limiting stenosis no indication for CAT, and after one year, this patient has no event. This approach is sustained by the evidence that the negative predictive value of FFRCT is very high, 90%. So this is a typical example in which you are able to provide anatomical and functional evaluation with just one technique. Check the second case, 59 years old man, similar history, T negative ways in the lateral leads, and we found multiple stenosis all intermediate stenosis, LAD 45%, first diagonal branch 55%. Again, FFRCT was normal also in this case, same conclusion of the previous case. So uh, this patient had a positive EKG, so it means that there was evidence of ischemia, but FFRCT was negative for ischemia. For this reason, the patient was not referred to CAT and no event were observed. But more interesting in the third case. The patient with 53 years old, so, uh, chest pain, suspected for coronary artery disease and a positive exercise ECG. So there is a formal indication to invasive coronary geography. According to the design of the study, we scanned the patient with CT and with FFRCT. We found this critical lesion of the right coronary artery, as you can see, and the FFRCT was 0.77, just mild pathologic, because the cutoff is 0.8, mild pathologic. That was one of my first cases and I was a little bit disappointed because my feeling was okay, probably it's not so accurate because too much high degree of stenosis for this value. Anyway, that was enough to refer the patient to CAT and we referred the patient to CAT. And we found a critical lesion, very bad lesion, and this was the invasive FFR of this lesion, 0 0.76. Because this is a typical example that there is no direct relationship between anatomy and physiology. These are two different components in coronary artery disease. And so it's not mandatory to have a very low FFRCT with a very high degree of stenosis. And this is the reason why we need both information in the clinical cardiology and in the modern cardiology. So the conclusion was a flow limiting coronary artery stenosis and the patient was treated. But one of the main pitfalls of FFRCT is the image quality. Because, okay, it's not sensitive to calcification, but it's sensitive to a bad image quality. 
And this is the reason why a new generation scanner is useful in this setting, because if you improve your image quality, you can analyze whole cases with FFRCT. Uh, this is an example in which we have a patient with positive SPECT, in which we found a lot of classification and disease on LAD. Very challenging patient from an anatomical point of view because small vessel, severe classification, very difficult. Then we have no disease on left circumflex artery, but there was this misalignment artifact and good image quality of the right coronary artery with no significant disease. So the question is, which is the FFRCT of the LAD? That is the diagnostic question. And we uh, analyzed these uh, uh, images and unfortunately the analysis was rejected due to the presence of the uh, uh, misalignment artifact. The reason is that the model works if the image quality is good for all three vessels because it's a sort of interactive model between all three coronary arteries. So it's not enough to have a good image quality in one vessel, a bad image quality in another one, because otherwise you are not able to evaluate the FFRCT. For this reason, it's very important to follow a good protocol for acquisition. These are the, our last guidelines that we have published as a Society of Cardiovascular Computer Tomography uh, to improve the image quality and the reporting of a cardiac computer tomography coronary angiography. But let me move uh, for the last uh, part of the presentation, a few minutes, uh, about the additional alternative that we have behind the fractional flow reserve. That is the stress CTP. Uh, stress CTP, okay, the first thing that you have to manage is I have to do rest followed by stress acquisition or I have to do stress acquisition followed by rest acquisition. Strength and weakness based on your choice. Rest stress protocol has a very great strength. You do the perfusion with the knowledge of coronary artery anatomy. That means that if the patient has no disease, you can avoid to scan the perfusion test. Or if the, case, or if the patient has a left main artery disease, you can skip the perfusion test because it could be dangerous. So this is the great strength of the patient. The limitation is that during the rest acquisition, usually you use nitratis and beta blockade to provide vasodilatation and to reduce the heart rate of the patient. And both of these drugs, nitratis and beta blocket, are responsible to protect against the ischemia the patient. So when you scan the stress phase, there is the risk that you have less sensitive because you have the effect of the drugs that you have used in the rest, in the rest phase. So for this reason, you can do uh, the opposite order, stress before, followed by rest. But the strength is that there is no interaction with drugs. The pitfall is that in this uh, case, it means that you do stress in all patients. And at the end, if you have used this strategy, it's better that you use a more robust technique like stress or something different. The great advantage of a CT is that you have anatomy before a stress test. Okay, when you have scanned the patient, how you evaluate the stress CTP? This is a typical visual examination. So static CTP, I mean just one data set at the peak of the effect of adenosine. And you have this perfusion effect here, this perfusion effect that is well matched with the left anterior descending artery stenosis. Very fast analysis. The limitation that is a software for beam hardening artifact. What that means? Due to the presence of high contrast attenuation related to the contrast stage in the blood pool, you can have a dark area in the inferopostal lateral wall that is positive and that could be create a false positive case. So for this reason, you can do something that is more quantitative, such as the transmural perfusion ratio. You measure the contrast attenuation in the subendocardium. You measure the contrast attenuation in the subepicardium. You calculate the ratio of this contrast attenuation and if you have a value below 0.9, this indicates ischemia. Very time consuming. But the most interesting thing is to calculate the myocardial blood flow in a dynamic perfusion. What is the dynamic perfusion? It's a very simple approach. It's the same thing of cardiac MI. You do multiple acquisition during uh, adenosine effect of the uh, cardiac chamber just to record the washing and wash out of contrast agent. And then you can calculate the myocardial blood flow. This is an experiment of Alessia Rossi from UK, in which you can calculate the myocardial blood flow of the myocardium. And this is the area when you have ischemia because the low velocity is associated with uh, um, uh, perinfarctual ischemia. Is accurate the stress CTP? Quite good. 
the accuracy range between 81% and up to 93%. But there is some, one thing that you can do to improve the diagnostic accuracy of a CT, that is the use of a dual energy approach. One of the main limitations of the stress CTP is that the black area is the effect of low iodine concentration for sure, but is related to a lot of other factors, including the structure of the patient, for example. If you have dual energy CT, you can evaluate the true distribution of the iodine across the left ventricle myocardium, left ventricle myocardium mass. And this means that you have a very true map of the perfusion of the left ventricle. This is our first case that we did and published in European Journal of Cardiovascular Imaging, in which we have a patient with occlusion, chronic occlusion of my left anterior descending artery. This is the iodine distribution at rest. After adenosine injection, we observe the iodine distribution under stress. The blue area is a ischemic area. This is the ischemic area. This is the ischemic area. The patient was treated by PCR plus stent, and this was the distribution of the iodine under stress after the treatment, no ischemia. What you find here at the apex is normal because the apex is so thin that you can have enough contrast attenuation in the apex. The further problem is the effective radiation dose. The mean dose published in the literature about the effective radiation dose of stress CTP is for stress plus rest up to 12 millisievert. So not so good. You are able, sorry, to acquire one patient with less than one millisievert. It means that the cumulative dose for a stress rest analysis is around three, four millisievert maximum. And now I will show you some cases, and then we conclude my presentation. These cases are uh, um, uh, uh, part of a trial that we are conducting in our hospital. Uh, we are uh, the coordinator center, and uh, this trial includes the Paris Center and Brussels Center. And this is the perfection study. You can find the design of a study on JCCT. What we did? We included patients scheduled for invasive cornea angiography, and we scanned this patient with static CTP or dynamic CTP, the two different ways to do a stress test. And then the patient for each patient, uh, and then the patient were referred to invasive cornea angiography. What we did? This is the patient preparation. Then the patient do the rest CT scan. And by using the rest data set, we evaluate the coronary artery imaging and the FFRCT. Then the patient is on the table 15 minutes just to have the washout of the contrast agent. And then we start with the adenosine injection and we scan the patient with rest, uh, with the stress static CTP or with the dynamic CTP. So the aim is to compare the FFRCT versus stress CTP in the same patient. The Studies are still ongoing, so I can show you just the cases and not the number. And I will show you two cases. 83 years old man with a positive spect. We scanned the patient with the CT, very, very challenging situation. Because low attenuation of the coronary artery vessel, the patient was obese, several calcifications here, here, and here. From an anatomical point of view, you can just say that right coronary artery is hypoplasic. So it's not important. But on the other two vessels, LAD and left circumflexed artery, we can estimate that there is obstructive coronary artery disease, but we are not sure because there is so huge calcification that it is possible that when we refer the patient to CAT, there is no significant obstructive coronary artery disease. This is the perfusion at rest. The orange color map means that there is no perfusion effect, normal perfusion effect in two chamber, three chamber, and four chamber view. Then we start with adenosine injection, and this is the perfusion distribution under stress condition. The purple area here, 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 and here, indicated, and here, indicated the presence of a subendocardial perfusion effect. So we have perfusion effect in the territory of LAD and left circumflex artery. These are the two short axis view in comparison. This is the perfusion at rest. This is the perfusion under stress, and check again the ischemic, uh, the perfusion defect in the lateral wall, and the perfusion defect in the septal, uh, anteroseptal anterior wall in the middle apical portion. We did the FFRCT in the same patient, okay? And as you can see, there is right coronary artery is mild pathologic, but just because it's a hypoplastic vessel, and this is from physiological point of view expected. We found pathologic FFRCT of left circumflex artery, 0.7, and pathologic FFRCT of the LAD, 0.558.
check that the FFRCT became positive from the middle segment up to the apical segment. So there is a direct relationship between when the FFRCT became positive and, when, and where there is the perfusion defect detected by stress CTP. The patient was referred to CAT. And what you find here? Multiple disease of the marginal branch, here, severe disease. On the contrary, on LAD, there is no apparently significant critical stenosis, multiple moderate stenosis. The right coronary artery was hypoplasic as expected. So it, 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 it seems that on a left circumflex artery is correct, but we have a false positive cases on LAD. But when we measure the invasive FFR on LAD, the invasive FFR was 0.67. And the reason was very simple. The LED provided a lot of collateral to the lateral territory that is not covered by left circumflex artery, and therefore these stenoses that are not critical are enough to create an ischemia in LED as well. So the matching is absolutely perfect. And this is another case. 57 years old man, he had a cardiac arrest 30 years ago. He was referred at that time to invasive coronary angiography no significant obstructive coronary artery disease, and that was enough for the cardiology of 30 years ago, before ICD implantation. And the patient started to do excess ECG, a lot of tests each year, always negative. But one year ago, the first EKG became positive. And per protocol, the patient was evaluated with CT. Occlusion of the left anterior descending artery, here. Occlusion of the left circumflex artery, here. Occlusion of the right coronary artery, here, triple, triple coronary artery occlusion. The patient has no symptoms, okay, so <laughs> just, mild, just positive, no significant symptom, just positive uh, excess ECG and was not very huge positive EKG. Okay, uh, we did the perfusion at rest, uh, we, we did the CT scan and we did the perfusion at rest. No perfusion effect in two chamber, no perfusion effect in two chamber, perfusion effect at rest here, in the lateral wall. When you have this perfusion defect, it means two things. First, myocardi unknown myocardial infarction or perfusion at rest due to the presence of very critical stenosis. When we did the um, stress acquisition, as you can see, we have uh, the onset of ischemia here, ischemia here, and you have a very huge ischemia on the septum and just a mild increase of ischemia in this area. It's better visualized with the short axis view. Rest, where you have the perfusion defect here, okay, and the stress, where you have the perfusion defect here, but also here and here and here. So this is a typical presence of perfusion defect not really reversible in the lateral wall and then perfusion defect in the other territory. That is compatible with reversal disease. We did the FFRCT and as you can see we found not so pathologic if far on right coronary artery, but because the vessel was occluded here and so it was not possible to calculate. Positive, clearly positive FFRCT on LAD and the number is small, no pathologic uh, FFRCT on left circumflex artery. So there was a little bit mismatch between FFRCT and uh, stress CTP because the lateral wall, one is positive from perfection perspective and FFRCT is normal on left circumflex artery. Oh, sorry. Just the dose of this patient range between 3 and 4, including everything, rest plus stress. Invasive coronary angiography. Okay? There was just one marginal branch that sustained everything. LED, right coronary artery, everything is sustained from one vessel. Okay? So, what happened? Uh, we cannot calculate the invasive FFR here, as you can imagine. But why the FFRCT was normal in the left circumflex artery? Because in that area there was an occlusion of the vessel, but there was a myocardial infarction as well. So, in terms of a balance of a flow, a myocardial mass, from physiopathological point of view, the FFRCT and the invasive FFR could be normal as well. Let me just skip this, uh, uh, just show you the last cases and then I finish it. This is a 65 years old man. Uh, with uh, suspected coronary artery disease, the patient was referred to CAT, to, to cardiac CT. No disease, significant disease on all trivers. So it, is, it, it seems that there is no disease. We did the perfusion at the rest that was normal, 
and we need a perfusion at the stress that was positive in lateral wall. So there is a mismatch between anatomy and perfusion effect. No disease on coronary artery heart anatomy and perfusion effect. We calculated the FFRCT that was normal on all three vessels. So FFRCT is in agreement with coronary artery anatomy and perfusion effect is not in agreement. When we referred the patient to CAT, we found that there was no disease. And I have not, uh, and I have no disease on uh, like right coronary artery, left circumflex artery, sorry. We found, we found a pathology of very small left circumflex coronary artery. We calculated the FFRCT, the invasive FFR that was normal, 0 0.95. So there is a good matching with the FFRCT. Why the perfusion defect was positive? Because that is a typical area, waiting for the dual energy CT, the typical area where you can have fast positive, positive cases due to the presence of beam hardening artifact. So, the question to conclude. Okay, we have a lot of options, but who is the winner? We need to find the winner, probably. Usually in the life, we need to find the winner. And to find the winner, we have performed this study, that is the performance study that is actually under second revision on Jack, in which we did a meta-analysis, including all imaging modality, to test the diagnostic accuracy of coronary artery disease. And which is the result? A little bit complicated course, but I will explain in detail. The red line and black line indicated the stress echo and the SPECT that are located in the lowest range in terms of diagnostic accuracy. In the middle, there is a CT, blue line, that improved, is improved if you apply FFRCT, that is the green line. The top of detection as compared to invasive FFR is stress MR, PET and stress CTP. Despite for stress CTP we have still few numbers. So from just a cultural point of view, then we have to test the cost effectiveness of this workflow. In terms of diagnostic accuracy perspective, if you have a suspect patient with intermediate risk and suspect the coronary artery disease, the first thing is to rule out coronary artery disease. And so you have to use the test with the highest negative predictive value, CT. If CT is negative, that is enough, you stop here. If CT is positive, considering that the positive predictive value is not robust, you can add the FFRCT without any kind of additional test, because if FFRCT is negative, you stop here. If FFRCT is positive, actually the positive FFRCT is not still robust to indicate always invasive coronary angiography. In this very small subset of a patient, we can decide to spend a little bit of money to use robust tests, I mean PET, stress MR, and in case the stress CTP will become very powerful on the ground, stress CTP as well. Because in this way, you can catch the aim to not have a patient without disease in CAT and to reduce the overall number of inappropriate PCI, inappropriate revascularization. It is a very urgent problem in the era of modern cardiology. So for this reason, I want just to say that a lot of these problems have been resolved. And I will conclude with this my editorial published in the European Art Journal with the following title Anatomy and Physiology in Ischemic Heart Disease, a Second on a Moon. The reason of this title is that thanks to the introduction of a CT that is now able to provide anatomical and functional information, probably the era of the Second on a Moon has just started. I want just to thank all people that work with me because without the contribution of this Wonderful guys should be impossible for us to do this huge amount of research activity. Thank you so much.